Hello, I am legendary game designer Todd Howard. Before your regularly scheduled programming, I'd like to come clean to all of you about something. I really put my heart and soul into Skyrim. And I mean literally, I actually placed my heart and soul in an object within the world of Skyrim. This is why I am so insistent that every platform, even every kitchen appliance, has a port of Skyrim. If it stops getting played, I will literally cease to exist. It is also why Starfield is completely soulless. I literally don't have a soul in my body. It's in Skyrim, and... I'm gonna let you finish, but I gotta let everyone know that disillusioned players got a real banger for y'all. Take it away, DP. Thanks, Kanye. Bethesda just released their biggest, most expensive game ever, and it was expected to be a game changer. Instead, it was mid on release and becomes far less than mid the more you play it. When I did my early impression of the game, I said it was a disappointment but was at least fun. That was about 20 hours into the game. After only 10 more hours, I realized that I had experienced pretty much everything the game had to offer and there was a sudden drop off in its enjoyability. Sure, I had only explored a small fraction of its planets, and sure, there was plenty more of the story to experience. But there is no need to actually do any of this when all the planets are empty, with the same handful of copy-pasted points of interest scattered here and there, and the story and characters are uninteresting, poorly written, and shallow in substance but abundant in woke backstories to uncover. Bethesda has more resources than ever yet has grown more incompetent and creatively bankrupt than ever. This experience has obviously not just been my own, but has been reflected on a wide scale in the quick decrease in its player reviews on Steam that just keeps getting worse and worse by the day. So many people are discovering that after the initial excitement of playing a new Bethesda game wears off, there's nothing left to keep the experience interesting. And to add insult to injury, Bethesda has been embarrassingly responding to all the top reviews by copy-pasting the same few responses attempting to gaslight the reviewers into thinking they're the problem rather than Starfield actually being a massive failure. And on top of this, modders have beat Bethesda to the punch on fixing performance issues and missing features, in some cases by months. How in the world are individual modders making better and faster fixes in their spare time than a company with hundreds of employees, Microsoft's support, and bazillion dollars? Again, Bethesda has more resources than ever yet has grown more incompetent than ever. And this is not unique to Bethesda. Rockstar, previously known for its high quality standards, released one of the worst, laziest remasters of all time, and followed that up by charging people $50 for a simple port of the decade-old Red Dead Redemption. Forspoken, which its developer Luminous Productions promised would be a technical marvel, was absolute trash in every way. Cyberpunk 2077, the second most expensive game of all time, released in an unplayable state. Mass Effect Andromeda was a buggy mess with terrible facial animations, and which overall took a massive dump on the series. Arcane Studios, a subsidiary of Bethesda, released Redfall this year with still photos for cutscenes, an abundance of performance issues and bugs, and was overall simply not a finished game. These stories seem like the norm in the modern game industry. So why exactly is this happening? How in the world is it the case that these companies have larger budgets than ever but struggle to release finished, high-quality games? Well, there are a number of contributing factors. Obviously, there's the fact that quality standards among gamers have increased enormously, with the expectation of larger, more detailed worlds with photorealistic graphics. In 2007, it was acceptable not to have every object and NPC be interactable and every interior enterable. It was okay for every level to be narrow and linear and for graphics to be somewhat blocky. It was acceptable for a game to be focused on one specific gameplay element, and you weren't expected to implement RPG elements like skill trees and branching dialogue options in every single genre. Develop Developing a game has become a much, much larger task, meaning you need more hands on deck, larger budgets, and a lot more time. So then add into the mix the fact that those providing the larger budgets are not game developers. They are businessmen whose only interest is making as much money as possible, as fast as possible. They are the ones often setting the deadlines, and they are more often than not going to choose an earlier release date over a polished game. While putting money first is certainly a terrible approach when creating art, you really can't blame them entirely for not wanting to wait a decade for their investments to pay off. If games don't make a profit, you can't make more games. So to some degree, you do have to make some sacrifices to make your business model feasible. And of course, on top of this, most of the aforementioned games were also impacted by COVID, which only made the battle between time and profit all the more difficult. While this alone could itself account for a drop-off in quality, it is certainly not the whole of the matter. Because it not only seems that developers do not have enough time to complete their games, but also that studios have become less competent, efficient, and creative. Again, think of the modders releasing better and faster fixes for Starfield than Bethesda's enormous team is capable of. 
Well, I believe that there are three primary factors at play here that account for this. First, there's the damaging effects of poorly managed growth. Second, there's the negative influence of investors and modern workplace standards. And third, partially as a result of the first two, there is the crisis of competence. So first, there's poorly managed growth. Both Bethesda and Rockstar began their classic industry-changing series with relatively small teams that were all working closely with their passionate creative forces. The Elder Scrolls series from its inception to the development of Skyrim peaked at around 100 people. While this is a somewhat larger number, it is still within the range of the amount of people that a single individual can know, according to Dunbar's number. This allowed for its main passionate creative talent to be able to closely direct everyone working on the game, allowing their passion to rub off on everyone involved. The teams were still small enough that only one person made all the dungeons in Oblivion, and the number increased only to eight for the dungeons in Skyrim. But during the development of Starfield, the number of Bethesda employees increased to 450, with 250 of them working on the game and others from outside also being brought in. It had gotten so big that, as former Bethesda developer Bruce Nesmith claims, and the structure of the company also was such that, you didn't get to interact with Todd as much anymore. In other words, the company got so large that you didn't have that intimate interaction with the main creative force of the game. It was just a bunch of disconnected employees tinkering away at someone else's idea. This is a perfect recipe for the sort of soulless, uninspired game we got. Grand Theft Auto was similar. GTA 3 had a team of just 23 people, and while the company did end up bringing on a massive amount of employees, with over 1,000 people working on GTA 5, the initial creative minds behind the series still successfully maintained a considerable influence for a time. In Jason Schreier's Bloomberg article entitled Rockstar Games Cleaned Up Its Frat Boy Culture, the fact that they had managed to maintain an environment that resembled the initial 23 guys having a good time is highlighted as a negative thing. But a company run like a group of frat boys messing around is the only creative creative environment I could ever imagine producing great entries in the GTA series. The problem, though, is that it had gotten too big for that culture to be maintained, and with the announcement that they'll be turning into a sanitized, politically correct company, and with the departure of many of Rockstar North's central creative minds, it seems that its inevitable end has come. It is simply the case that for a creative project, you must either have a small team working closely with its central creative minds, or else its main creative minds must have both the power and ability to maintain an inspired culture among a large team that can express their ideas the way they picture them. In the latter case, it requires both directors with the rare combination of high creativity and exceptional leadership ability, and a company structure that is somewhat autocratic. This autocratic part is pretty much an impossibility in the West at this point for a number of reasons, but is actually closer to how many studios are run in Japan. Thus, in Japan you've got people like Hidetaka Miyazaki making extremely inspired games with an uncompromised vision that you simply don't see with AAA games in the West. Without hierarchy, you simply can't do it. You either have to be small enough for your main creative force to maintain influence, or else you'll get big and your company's culture will get diluted. Related to this is the second reason, which is the negative influence of investors and modern workplace standards. Let's return to the Rockstar example again to demonstrate this. Rockstar had a frat boy culture. You know who doesn't like frat boy culture? Women. But you know who Rockstar had to hire in order to comply with anti-discrimination legislation and diversity expectations? Women. Rockstar therefore had two choices, hire people who will hate working for your company or change the company culture and inevitably sacrifice their creative vision. Rockstar seems to have initially chosen the former option, but of course that created problems. They had employees complaining about how the company was run, and this made its way to the media, which is of course a bad look to investors. The investors thus likely demanded that the company, which produces games that are intentionally offensive and appeals to males, restructure their company in a way that stops offending people and is appealing to females. In addition to this, investors have grown increasingly demanding concerning the politics that are expressed in both the structure of the companies they invest in and in the products they release. Thus, ESG scores. The biggest enforcers are the biggest investors who have their tentacles in pretty much every company in existence, BlackRock and Vanguard. This only exacerbates the problem of maintaining a culture that is focused on the studio's creative vision. Not only are they forced to hire people that may not be a good fit for the culture they are cultivating, but they are also forced to focus on adding elements to their game for political purposes instead of purely for the sake of improving the game's quality. The task of checking all the diversity boxes to ensure a good ESG score has become so cumbersome that many of the biggest games of the last five or so years have outsourced it to a consulting company called Sweet Baby Inc., which Griffin Gaming covers in detail in a video I'll link in the description. This company has done wokeness consultation for God of War Ragnarok, Spider-Man 2, Alan Wake 2, and many others, having been contracted by PlayStation, Xbox Game Studios, EA, Act 
Activision Blizzard, Ubisoft, Take-Two, Rockstar, Remedy, and Valve. They have quickly become a widely utilized service all across the industry, taking advantage of the high pressure from investors to propagandize video games. Not only does this decrease the quality of the games that are produced by running every asset, line of dialogue, UI and gameplay element, and so forth, through a filter that exchanges quality for woke propaganda, but it also adds more time and expense to projects to run every decision through them and implement their changes. But on top of this, there is an increasing expectation among modern employees that employers be less demanding and eliminate any sense of a power dynamic. This of course further prevents the needed creative hierarchy from being implemented, and thus decreases both the unity of the studio's vision and decreases efficiency. Though he's gay and probably part of the problem in many other ways, Tim Kaine is part of the older generation of game developers who understands this problem. In a YouTube video called Game Development Caution, Kaine provides three stories of working on games with the new generation of developers. In the first, he recounts how his older studios used to have a whiteboard where he would write tasks that needed to get done and the names of the people assigned to complete them. But when working with a team of newer developers, people threatened to quit over that system. They didn't like the pressure of having their name on the board for everyone to see. In the second story, Kane asked to have a simple few lines of code written for his game's combat system. When it was added to the programmer queue, they estimated it would take a whole four weeks to complete. He pushed back, explaining that he'd written it before and it would only take about 45 minutes. Both the programmer and another employee then came in and yelled at Kane for being so demanding. Kane then said that he would just do it himself, which was rejected because his higher position would supposedly make his code untouchable, which I guess wouldn't be fair or something. He ended up having to accept that it would take multiple weeks to complete. In the third story, he explained that he and Leonard Boyarsky often get passionate about their ideas and start yelling out of excitement. This made the new developers nervous and they complained about it, requesting that their higher-up go and make them stop. The main creative minds behind a game are not allowed to take charge, instill passion, or hold people to high standards of efficiency. In order to create a more fair working environment, the people with real talent are not allowed to be favored or given command over others. This undoubtedly causes games to take far longer to make and dilutes their creative vision. The last reason for the simultaneous ballooning budgets and decrease in quality is the competency crisis. Morgoth's review has a great video describing this phenomenon in society at large, which I will link in the description. But to describe it succinctly, the competency crisis is the wide-scale negative impact of the replacement of meritocracy with inclusivity, mostly as a result of post-civil rights legislation. Because companies are forced to make inclusivity a higher priority than competency, this often results in people who are less qualified or not even qualified at all being hired for a position over the most competent applicant. With such decisions being made over and over, this results in every industry being filled with people in charge of processes that they are not competent to handle. And the effects of this incompetency are compounded as these poorly managed processes interact with each other, with one poorly managed process depending on another poorly managed process that depends on yet another and so on. The quality of services declines significantly and even those who are competent are handicapped by their reliance on the incompetent. Since the gaming industry is forced to comply with this same approach to filling positions, it is likewise undoubtedly filled with less competent developers who were chosen for the sake of diversity and inclusivity. Considering the already bloated budgets and time constraints of game development, just imagine how much worse the situation is with less competent employees, with less talented, less efficient employees being hired. Each task undoubtedly takes longer and requires more employees to handle it, which of course drastically increases the cost of development. With how expensive and time-consuming game development already is, a studio simply can't afford to adopt such an inefficient approach to hiring. But since they have no choice, games are only made all the more expensive and take all the more time to bring to completion. And with studios full of employees chosen for reasons other than talent, it is only inevitable that the games will be less skillfully crafted. So basically what I'm getting at with all of this is that games are already very hard to make. And with woke policies and practices, the chances are only made even more slim that a studio is going to be able to carry out a great idea. Unless the few exceptionally talented individuals in a studio are afforded the power and creative freedom to create the company culture necessary to accomplish their vision, there will be a far lower ceiling on the quality of the games they are capable of producing. Anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and all that.